Today we're beginning a brand new series entitled All In. You've picked a great day to be here in person, or if you're watching online, great day for you to stay with us, to stay tuned in. And so we're kind of in this new year mode, and I don't know what you do in your household or your family, but we kind of spend that last week of the year looking backwards, and then we start to anticipate what's coming. Some of you may have actually written down some of your hopes or your dreams, your desires, your goals for this upcoming year. Maybe you've done that. Or maybe you're like so many at this point who just kind of given up on the idea of even writing them down any longer. Why? Because you tried it. And well, after a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, you kind of find that that old pattern begins to reveal itself, begins to look familiar again. And I just ask the question, why does that happen that way? Why is it that we can have all of these hopes, dreams, and desires for a new year, for a new opportunity, and yet find ourselves after a little bit kind of stuck in a rut, repeating old patterns again? Maybe for you, it's you want to have better health or you want to read more, less TV. Maybe you want to go to the gym, whatever those things are. I hope that you have some goals and some thoughts and some ideas for the upcoming year. But what about your spiritual goals? What do those look like for you? Have you written those down? I, I just kind of alluded to what my wife and I, we, we've been asking the Lord, God, we want to see certain things. We want to experience certain areas of growth, not just in our own hearts, but in our family, not just in our family, but also in this church family. We, we have hopes and dreams for you spiritually for this year. And we're praying and we're asking God to come and to meet those. And, and so as we look at this, I, I just want to ask the question, what if it came down to one decision? What if breaking through that pattern, even spiritual pattern, came down to one decision? And I want to present this decision here uh, today in this series as we kick things off with the idea of all in. And so as we set this up just a little bit, what does it look like to be all in? You probably know Jesus's famous words when he describes how our heart should be towards our heavenly father. He would use the word all several times over. You should love the Lord, your God with all of your, is that an upside down heart? Did I get there with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, your might, your mind, you should love God with your all. In other words, we should be there you go. You got it. We should be all in. We're called to be an all in kind of people. So let me help to just set this up for just a second to give you a little bit of illustration. Now, all in, I don't know if it kind of triggers ideas in your mind. Well, for me, it, it kind of has a, a bit of a, a poker analogy, if you will. Uh, so let me go there for just a second. Follow along with me. And so maybe you could just imagine it's, it's in this dark room and there's this you know, green felt table. And anytime I see like one of my favorite movies, there's always before the, like the showdown and the battle between the two, there's often this, this poker scene. There's this scene where you, you've got them in tuxedos and decked out and you've got the evil genius villain and he's sitting across the table and they're stacked with chips. And then you have our hero. And of course he's contemplating, he's thinking through what to do. And then comes this famous moment. It's the all in moment. If you don't know what Texas Hold'em is, it's often a poker game that people play. And there comes this moment where one individual believes that they've got the very best hand. They have absolute confidence in what they're about to do. And they make the decision to push everything, to risk it all, to put it all in the middle and see what happens next. This poker analogy, this all in concept, this has spiritual parallels. See, when we look at our faith, 
what it means to follow Jesus, there's this call to go all in. There's this idea that we're supposed to trust it all, to push it all out, to have absolute faith and confidence in the hand that God is dealing us. And so I want to show you over the next couple of minutes, just starting with a place in scripture where Jesus begins to call all of his disciples. And so let's look at this. You know that Jesus had 12 disciples, Judas even being in there, and he would come and he would begin to call each one of them by name. And I love that. He calls you by name today. And watch this. And so this is Jesus speaking about Jesus in Matthew uh, chapter four. And it says, as Jesus was walking beside the sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, this is Peter and his brother, Andrew, and they're casting their nets, they're fishermen. And Jesus is going to show up on the scene. And then he's going be, to begin to say this famous line to them. And let's say these words together. Come follow me. These two simple words just strung together. And Jesus begins to extend an invitation to come and to follow. This invitation he's going to put out for Peter and his brother Andrew, he says, listen, if you'll come leave your nets behind, I'm going to bring significant purpose into your life. Things are going to change. Things are going to shift. With this simple phrase, he invites them to become followers of, of Jesus, of himself. And of course, they took him up on the offer. And here's what they did. They left their nets and they did what? And they followed him. They followed Jesus. So Peter and Andrew become one of these first 12 disciples. And Jesus is going to continue to make his way around. There's going to be crowds of people. And he sees not just the crowds. He sees the individuals. He sees you. He sees your heart. He sees right where you are. And he begins to extend invitation to say, come, follow me. He says this same idea again as he's calling the disciple Matthew. Here's what he says in Matthew 9 and 9. What's the words again? Follow me, Jesus told them. And Matthew got up and he did exactly that. He began to follow Jesus. This invitation is significant. It has deep, profound meaning. It's not just, well, what do I follow you? Like to some geographical location? Like, where are we going to go, bro? Like, it's not that. Jesus is speaking to him on a much deeper, more profound level. To come and follow is an invitation. It's an invitation to become what we call disciple. You may not know this, but early church followers or early disciples weren't actually called Christians. They were disciples. They were known as AKA followers of the way. And so Jesus extends this invitation. He's going to call all and he invites them to follow as disciples, more like they become this apprentice, this understudy. They're going to get up next to, and they're going to learn about, and they're going to begin to imitate and model it in their own lives. Jesus would extend this call to all, and that all, it would shock some people. See, we would expect Jesus to come and call the righteous, the people who seem like they got it all together. Like, there ain't no fault in me. I'm a good person. We would think that Jesus would come and just call that select group of people. And it was shocking because he would call all. Jesus would begin to call the social outcast. Jesus would even call prostitutes. Jesus would call lepers, people with like skin conditions and disease. Jesus would call degenerates. Jesus would call all, even not just saints, but sinners. And it's that invitation, even Matthew, who was this tax collector, like the worst of the worst of sinners, Jesus begins to call all. And he says this simple invitation, and it's repeated over and over again, follow me, follow me, follow me. And if I could say something to you today, the spirit says to you, follow me, follow Jesus. But what does that mean? What does that look like? How do we do that. I want to show you today as we set this up and ask the question, are you, are you following? Is your heart following Jesus? What does it mean to follow him? Let's look at it over just a couple of minutes. And as he begins to extend this idea to follow, he would begin to expound on it and help people to understand it. And I'm going to go ahead and throw a warning label on this bad boy. What you're going to see next. Oh, it's a little disturbing. It's a little bit like, whoa, bro, like, come on. I mean, follow. Okay, I got that. But you might be taking this too far. 
Watch what Jesus says to them as he extends this invitation to follow. And then he begins to clarify what it means to follow Christ. Here's what he says in Luke. And so there's this large crowd and they're, of course, following, right? They're gathered around and anywhere he would go, masses would show up. He's doing miracles. I mean, come on. I want to see the miracles. I'm going to be on the perimeters on the outside. And he sees this group of people. He sees these followers and he begins to say something to them. Hey guys, listen up. You want to live your best life now? Listen, here's what you need to do. Just follow and all your hopes and dreams and desires are going to come true. I wish he set it up like that. It's not what follows that statement. Watch this. He says, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to be a follower of mine, oh, bro, I have a hard time even reading this. He says, you actually have to hate everyone by comparison. Wait, what? Your father and your mother, your wife and your children, your brothers and your sisters, yet even your own Yeah, even your own life, you got to hate it by comparison. Otherwise, you cannot be. Mm, Wait, what? Jesus, like, he's a master communicator. Like, he's so gifted that everybody would come and hear him just because of the authority of his spoken word, his ability to take illustrations and parables and make them in ways that landed in the heart. He was a master communicator. But man, like, if I'm trying to set out a sales pitch, he's a terrible salesman. This is not how you onboard the masses, is it? (laughs) Jesus is going to say unapologetically, listen, if you love something else more than me, then you can't even be my disciple. He's going to keep going on. And he says this, he says, if you do not carry your own an instrument of death, wait, what? If you don't carry your, your, your cross and, and follow me, then again, you cannot, you, you can't be my disciple. And this is where it still really starts to hit home because then it makes me like, wait, am I doing that? Like at what level am I following? What does it look like for me in my heart? Do I love all of these? I love my children a lot. I love my wife a lot. Do I place things above the Lord in my life? This becomes a really important question, especially as we're asking, am I following? The invitation has been extended, and I would probably guess that, well, the majority of you have already said yes to the invitation to follow. But I wonder, who's following who? I wonder wonder if sometimes we get this all mixed up. I think that we do this at large within the church. I think sometimes we do this because... Well, we want following Jesus to be yet another box that we're going to check off. We want it to be convenient. We want to be willing and able to compromise. When he starts saying stuff like this, like, yo, if you're not carrying your own cross, well, then you can't even be a disciple of mine. And then he goes on and he says this. He says, but don't forget, don't begin until you, what's it say? Count the cost, count the cost. I wonder if you did that when you signed up. (laughs) I wonder if you understood what it looked like and meant to become a follower of Jesus when you raised your hand back in the day, every head bowed, every eye closed. Yes, I wonder if you understood what counting the cost actually meant. (laughs) I think sometimes for me, I could not have realized it until after, after I was taking a couple of steps. I don't know if you've realized it, that the closer you get to Jesus, the more he calls. And, and so for me now, following 20 plus years, I realized well, there's, some, there's some cost in all of this. It costs to follow Jesus. And these disciples, I think, I think they had a small glimpse of what it meant. I mean, they would understand in, in hindsight, in 2020, it, it costs them something. Jesus says that you should consider the cost of what it means to be a disciple, to be a follower of him. And, and it may mean that the cost is persecution. It actually is a promise of scripture. You know that? That, that if you're a follower of Jesus, that it might cost you your reputation. It, it might cost you something at work. It means that you're probably not going to be able to be in the same circle as everybody else. 
because your life is supposed to look different than that. It's going to cost them something. It might cost you reputation. I remember it cost me friendships. When I became a Christian, I was popular. I had friends and just being honest, we were into the party scenes. And when I started making changes, no, 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 this can't be a part of my life. It cost me relationships. It cost me friendships. It might cost you fill in the blank. Have you considered the cost? And as he lays this out, I just wonder if you still want to follow. Look, Jesus wasn't trying to make a sales pitch. He was trying to help you to understand what it would cost to go all in, to take the risk, to put all your chips in the middle. Jesus would begin to lay out this call to all, all in living in your life. And so I'm just amazed as I consider the disciples counted the cost or realized that it would cost them something and they still said yes. Why? They got a hold of something. They began to have a revelation in their heart that it doesn't matter what it would cost me in this life and in this world, that there was a greater payoff. There was a greater reward. And the disciples would weigh this out. They would count the cost and they still left their nets. They still followed closely. Did they always get it right? No. Do I always get it right? <laughs> Definitely not. Will you? No. If following Jesus closely is a condition of the heart. Living all in is a condition of the heart. And so let me show you this as Jesus is setting this up and he's making his not so great sales pitch about following him. He's going to lay out these things that are they're kind of counterintuitive. They're the opposites of what you naturally lean into. Let me just show you this one. And so here it says this. This is Luke and in nine. He says, and Jesus said to everyone, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? You see how he sets it up conditionally? Look, he, this, is an, this is an option for you. He gives you a choice. He will give you a choice, has given you a choice. But if, if you say, okay, I, I want to follow, I, I, this is what I've got to do. <laughs> I think I have an allergic reaction. I start itching when I read this word, <laughs> deny. No, no, I don't like that idea because you know what I would prefer? To indulge. Deny means that, like, I gotta, like, I gotta say no to some of the things that, well, some of the things that, you know, you might be after more influence or power or sex or drugs or whatever it is. These other things that begin to compete in your heart for Jesus' room and space that he's carved out, it, it says that we have to deny those things, those impulses, those implications, and this is counterintuitive. And Jesus calls us to that. And he says, you got to take up this cross daily. It means I got to put to death some of that old way. That's what it means to take up your cross, to crucify, to have it nailed to, to, to let those things die. Put to death your old ways, your former ways of doing, even ideals, sometimes even dreams. I have to submit them to God. This is what I was hoping and longing. And what I realized is, this is not actually in alignment with your word. And so I've got to deny that thing. I've got to put that thing to death and take up my cross and, and follow. And if I can't do that, if I'm not willing to do that. Again, not perfection. But if I'm unwilling to do these things, then he made it really clear. And so here's what he says next. And he says it this way in 24. For whoever would, it's like an oxymoron, isn't it? It's like the inverse. For whoever would save his life would lose it. Look, so many of us are, are in the business of saving our own, building up our own kingdom, our own ideals, our, our own way of doing things. And we think it's to protect my own, protect my own interests, my family, and we will build up our own little kingdoms. And the idea is that I would be advanced. Well, Jesus comes and he flips the script. He turns it upside down and he says, yo, like if you're trying to do that, it's actually going to cost you something. It's going to cost you your very soul. It's going to cost you eternity. In the end, the person who tries to save themselves 
you're going to lose it. But whoever, whoever would be willing to lay down, who would be willing to submit, who would ever would take these things that are inside of here and say, God, I'm all in with it. Push it in the middle and surrender it and trust it. This is what he says. If you will do that, then here's the thing that you need to see. It's through this and only through this that you actually gain the fulfillment of life. You discover your purposes and passions within God. See, for me, it, it took a long time to get past this idea of trying to save my own. I'm a fix it myself, take control of it kind of person. And to bring myself to the place and saying, okay, God, I'm going to stop white knuckling this and I'm going to trust it and release it into your hands. It's then that I found freedom. It's then that I stopped the merry-go-round of sin in my life. And any time I try to grab back and build my own kingdom, even 20 plus years later after following Jesus, it always leads to the same outcome. It costs. Sin will always cost you something. And anything that we put above God in our hearts and our lives is indeed it's sin. And so Jesus lays this argument out again, not trying to convince you or persuade you. He simply lays out truth and lets you respond to it. And I'm not trying to manipulate you. I'm reading the scripture for you. Take the notes, go read them for yourself. Weigh these things out in your own heart. What would it look like for me to lay down my own life, take up my cross and follow him? This is what it looks like. And so Jesus says this idea and he lays it out, saving, losing, and he lays out the concept. And so I want to show you just a couple of different examples and they're going to be contrasting. It helps to, to see like real life application. And so let me give you a couple of examples. The first one is known as the rich young ruler. You've probably heard about him or at least read about him in scripture. And I'm going to just show you and then we'll unpack it together. And so here's what it says. And behold, a man came to Jesus saying, teacher, what good deed must I do? I want to follow. More importantly, I want it all. I want everything I've got here in this life. Plus I want heaven. I want eternity. So what do I got to do? That's a good question. It's a question that we're often asking. What's the meaning of life and how do I get to its purpose? It, this is the question that's rolling around in his heart. And so he comes to Jesus and he begins to say to him, what good deed must I do? I'm a good person. So he already feels like he's kind of got some merit. And then this is what Jesus begins to say back to him. And Jesus says to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. And if you would enter into life, then keep the commandments. He thinks to himself, okay, well, I've done pretty good by the rules. Uh, imagine him being somewhat religious, trying to figure these out. And so the young man says back to him, he says, I've kept all of those. What's still lacking? He still has some chips in his pocket. He still has some things that he's holding on to. He has some things that he's not willing to push all in into the middle. And, and so Jesus sees right into the heart, just like he'll see into mine. And just like he sees into yours today, he sees right in. And for, for this man, for the rich young ruler, it, it was something to do with his wealth. It had his heart. He had put it above the place where God would reside. And he was unwilling to give it up. Watch. Here's what he says. Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go and sell your, all that you possess and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come there's that two letter word again, or two word phrase again, come and follow me. Same invitation, count the cost. He counted the cost and this is how he responds. Next verse, the young man heard this. What's he do? I can't push that in the middle, man. That's a lot of chips. Look, I like the hand that I've been dealt. I'm comfortable over here. I'm complacent over here. I'm good right here. And Jesus sees that thing in his heart and he says, that one right there. That's the thing that you need to let go of. You're holding on to it and it's time to push it in, to trust it, to surrender it. And he could not bring himself to do so. Um, this is just my opinion, but I think this is, one of the saddest stories in all of scripture. Look, he had everything that you and I think we need and want. 
bank account is full. I mean, come on, somebody. Can I have a fuller bank account, please? <laughs> bank account is full. He's a young man, and dude is loaded, which means he probably had power and influence. I, it doesn't even matter what he looked like. It doesn't say young and handsome. Because he has power and money and influence, he probably had his choice of people, right? So he has everything that the world would tell you, this is what you should build up and want. And he's going to protect that thing because, well, this is, this is my precious. He's going to hold tight to it, right? <laughs> Sorry, we watched that over the holiday. <laughs> and so here's what happens is he goes away because he can't push it all in. He's got to hold back for himself. And it breaks his heart. He's sorrowful because he realizes he's not willing to take the risk. He's not willing to put it all out in the middle. Now, you take this idea, and he goes away, and he's, he's sad about it. It cost him more than he's willing to sell. And so here's where we find ourselves, right? And this is, what the, this is the quote that I want to show you. And this is from a, another pastor named Mark Batterson. And he says this way, The gospel, it costs nothing, but it demands everything. The gospel, look, you can't buy grace. If this man could have bought grace, he would have bought grace. If he could have bought his favor with Jesus, you better believe he would have paid it on the spot. He couldn't buy his way into heaven. There was no way that he was going to be good enough on his own to make it. it what he realizes through this is the gospel would cost him nothing, but it would call him to go all in. It would cost nothing, but it demands everything. The grace of God that's extended towards you is a free gift. You cannot earn it. You can't buy it. They don't sell it down at Walmart. But when you say, I'm in, the call is to all. It's to push all the chips, to trust them with it, to surrender it to them. And when we want to withhold and keep our pieces in our pocket that we love the most, it's then that Jesus says, are you really following me? Are you still trying to get me to follow you? Jesus flips this whole thing. And the gospel costs us nothing, but it demands everything. And so this rich young ruler, he was unwilling. There are others and countless others. Let me just give you one. You remember the lady with the alabaster box? This is what it says in Luke about her account. And behold, this woman of the city who was a sinner, right? I love that. <laughs> when she learned that he was reclining at a table, this is Jesus, in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster flask of ointment. You probably are familiar with this. It's a perfume. It's, a, it's an oil-like substance of great, great value. And she's pretty poor. And this is one of her greatest possessions that she has in her entire world. And she does the unthinkable. She pushes it all in. She pops up the top. And as she's down washing the feet of Jesus, not with water, but with the tears rolling out of her eyes, she begins to do something that nobody else around could understand and others would condemn her for. It would cost her everything. She pours out her most valuable possession as a symbol of being all in. And when the community around doesn't get it, they start to chastise her. And there's this idea within scripture that those who have been forgiven much, love much. Now, I don't know about you, friend, but I know me. I know my past and my present, and I know my tendencies for my future. I understand how much I've been forgiven of. You're surrounded by people in this house who have been forgiven much and therefore love much. And you may not understand why it is that they're all in, why their faith looks like it does, but this is a group of people who've gotten a hold of the grace of God in their lives. And they're willing, no matter what the cost, no matter what the risk, to push it all in. All chips are in the middle. I'm going to trust you with it, Lord. There is nothing that I am withholding from you. And Jesus says, well, this gospel, <laughs> you can't buy it, but it's going to cost you. 
the thing that is closest to you? Are you willing to submit it and give it over to the Lord? And standing behind him with his feet, she's weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and she wiped them with the hair of her head and she kissed his feet and she anointed them with the ointment. We find one, well, he had, he had bought in. He bought into the ideals. I imagine he was, he was even trying to attend a church type thing but he was unwilling to sell out. He had bought into this concept, but he would not stack his chips in the middle. And so as we see this in countless other disciples who would count the cost and consider it worth the investment, worth the risk, we find so many of the disciples who would be willing to do so. And we find this call to you and I today. And so let me show you just a couple of different types of believers. The first one is the It's the all-in group. Like I said, you're probably surrounded to to a lot of them here in this house today. Those who said, Jesus, I love you, I'm for you, and no, I don't get it perfect, but Lord, I want to honor you in my heart. I I give you everything. I trust you. I surrender it to you. I am all-in. There's a second group of people that we find throughout Scripture they're described a few different ways, but they're, they're the half in, half out crowd. It's like, you know, I got a foot in, but I got another foot back here. And sometimes I lean this side of the fence, and sometimes I lean this side of the fence. They are called lukewarm in some places. And Jesus has a pretty strong opinion about that. There's this idea of like, I can play church. I can show up sometimes. I can check some boxes, but I want to sit on the fence because I want to be a good person. I want God to love me, but I'm going to cling tight to what I'm going to do because I want it my way. I want to do it how I want, when I want, and with whom I want. There's two different groups of people. The question really comes down to like, which one are you? Here's the question. Are you all in? This is the question I've been wrestling with, and I'm I'm not trying to pretend here. There are places in my heart that I feel like I've grabbed back from Jesus over time. Times when I put them all in the middle, and then along the way, for whatever reason, I, no, let me get that one back. You've heard today how the Lord is knocking on our hearts. You've heard today the call to everyone who will hear, everyone who will listen. It is a call to follow Jesus, but it costs us something. Have you counted the cost? Maybe you have, and you found yourself unwilling. Look, this ain't about condemning you. This ain't about you feeling guilty. This ain't to manipulate you in some way. This is your heavenly father through scripture calling to your heart. If you want this year to be any different than the ones before, if you want to break out of this pattern, if you're kind of tired of the monotony, can I tell you one of the worst places to live is on the fence. You're miserable on both sides. You can't go over here and enjoy sin because you're, you're conscious and the Holy Spirit starts condemning you, convicting you. You can't come into church and, and, and play because now you feel like, The worst place to sit is in the middle. Pick a side. Don't be lukewarm. Be all in. Go all out. Take the risk. It's worth it. Look, what is it? Like what in all of this is worth holding back? You could try to save yourself and end up losing it all? What? I won't know that about you, but it's in your heart right now. A whole morning, the Lord has been poking at it. I know what it is for me. I'm gonna tell you what I'm declaring. Jesus, all my chips are going in the middle. I'm not holding on to any of them. I've counted the cost. 
follow-up question. Why? Why would you withhold that? You've considered the cost of what it means to follow. Have you considered the cost of what it means to not follow? I realize this is weighty, but it can be one decision here that makes the decision or makes the direction for the rest of your year, for the rest of your life, eternity. This is an eternal decision, isn't it? And so in a sobering moment, I want you to think about it and consider it. Which one of the two am I? Mine all in? Am I a half in? Some of you may say, well, I haven't even put my toe in the water. I just showed up here because it's the first of the year and somebody invited me. I'm watching online today just because, you know, I randomly clicked through and the algorithm suggested it to me. I'm glad you're here. The same truth applies to you too. The invitation to follow, consider the cost on both sides of the coin. I'd like to pray for you. Father, this is a message that requires courage of heart. This is a message that causes us, forces us to respond. No response is a response. And Jesus, you are knocking on the door of our hearts and you extend the great gift of grace towards us that is a call to all to follow him. Lord, I believe it is every heart's desire to follow you closely. Lord, when we consider the cost, it doesn't even feel like a cost. God, in my own life, I just open up my hands and I surrender it to you. I surrender what I hold so tightly to. God, I'm all in. Lord, as a church, we are all in. God, forgive us for the places where we withhold from you, that we hold back. You're worthy of our trust. Look, if you're here in the room today and, and you're the third category, you're, I'm, I, I haven't made any decision to follow Jesus. I hope you feel the weight of this moment. And I hope you're considering what that would look like for you. That simple invitation to follow Jesus, <laughs> it was extended to all, even people like me people who come up short, people who continue to trip over their own feet. That invitation is for you today. Watching online, it's for you today. He says that if we would simply begin to confess our need for him, that he's faithful to forgive us, he invites us into relationship with us. And the beautiful thing about that relationship is it does not require some perfect standard you would never get there. You can't buy grace. It's been given to you through Jesus and only through his son. When you place your trust in him and you push your chips in and you begin to declare, I'm all in, that's a faith declaration. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to surrender to you. God, even in the places where I may not even want to yet, I'm still giving it to you. If you make that decision, whether you have never followed Jesus or you're a follower of Jesus, but you've kind of been half in and half out, look, you need to do some business with the Lord. You, you need to kind of confess that. You need to talk to him about it. Lord, I've been half in. I've been half out. I've been in the world. I've also been in my faith. God, forgive me. Lead me. Guide me. I push my chips into the middle. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.